I think Fantastic Beasts The Crimes of Grindelwald is the least Harry Potter movie out of all the not Harry Potter movies. Alright, look, I know that everything has already been said about this movie or these movies, but I don't care. I want to talk about it as well. And with Article 13 about to shut down YouTube, I guess I better do it now before they put me in jail. So, if you haven't seen Fantastic Crimes and Where to Grind Them yet, spoilers throughout. I love Harry Potter. I bought every new book as soon as it got released, as if some dude in a turtleneck had put a lowercase letter I in front of the titles. Isn't that awesome? I've read them, I've listened to the audiobooks read by Stephen Fry, by the way, the only reader that counts, and I've seen the movies many times over. So when I heard that they were making prequels, I was excited? I'm always cautious towards prequels because, well, you know where the story is going. But it turns out it's gonna have Grindelwald in it. That could be interesting. It's a villain we know came before Voldemort. It's someone we've known to have a different approach and rather than fear and violence, was known to use a more clever method of manipulation and persuasion. Interesting. Let's have a battle of wits between him and Sherl, I mean Dumbledore. Keep in mind that at this point in time, the only real piece of additional lore that Rowling had added to the main series after it was finished was Dumbledore's sexuality, and hints at him and Grindelwald being something more. Wait, it's it's based on that joke textbook thing they released as a as a gimmick to the original series? Well, okay, so this is how to train your snorkak. So the first movie comes out, and it's yeah, it's all right, it, but it's kind of weird, you know. It's got this kind of quirky guy that I can't quite decide if I like or not, and then like a comic relief character, a bossy lady, a floopy lady, and this emo kid that didn't perform well at the audition, I guess. So they just decided to cut all of his lines. And then Johnny Depp quite convincingly wearing the skin of now presumably deceased Colin Farrell, like the bug guy from Men in Black in the Edgar suit. Uh, is that letter? The movie was alright, it didn't blow me away or anything, and I found the reliance on CGI animals a bit on the heavy side, but the movie was called Fantastic Beasts, so I'll, I'll give it a pass. In the end though, I do like Newt as a character. I did grow quite fond of him, and I do think that Eddie Redmayne does quite a good job of portraying a somewhat socially awkward, fish out of water type of character. The other characters in the movie though, I'm, I, I, I don't, I never, I never care, I never cared. Not a great movie, but not a bad movie. The second movie, however, whoo wee. This new movie is one big snooze fest. I can honestly say that this is one of the few movies I've ever seen in the theater where I actually considered leaving and not coming back because my need to pee started to outweigh my interest in the movie. So the movie starts out with Grindelwald escaping after getting captured at the end of the first movie. I didn't last long, did it? Good job, magical coppers. The escape in itself is pretty weirdly set up though, like I, 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 I don't get it. The way it plays out is that Grindelwald is escorted into a carriage by some guy that works for the ministry, and they like take off with Thestrals pulling the whole thing off into the sky, Santa style. But then this rando ministry dude just apparates onto the underside of the wagon? while Grindelwald on the inside starts to polyjuice and whoops, it turns out that the ministry guy from before is actually in the wagon and the guy, the, the, the same ministry guy hanging on to the outside, it turns into Grindelwald. So, so they're, they're, they're switched places now. But, but why though? Why even do the whole switcheroo kind of thing? If, if you're gonna end up on the same transport anyway. Uh, whatever, so they just sort of hijack the whole thing, dick around for a bit with magic, and G-Money's escaped. He's loose again, and he's off to do his thing. His... his crimes, I, I guess? He does shack up in this random French house, and his friend does kill a baby. That is sort of criminal, I suppose. And now we're introduced to Newt again, and he's like mucking around with some fantastical beasts because the title of the movie still says Fantastic Beasts, so they had to put some in the movie somewhere. Even though I think the name of the franchise is The Wizarding World now? Or I, I don't know, it, it says like Wizarding World at the start, but then it also says Fantastic 
beasts, but then it also says crimes of great- You know what? Whatever. There's also this assistant lady person who's like real hot for Newton. She like asks him to take his shirt off. It's kind of weird. Like where is this- where is this plot line gonna go? Nowhere. That's where. Literally, it's never mentioned again. She's never- she's not in the movie from this point on. So Newt goes off to have a chat with Dumbledore and Dumbledore's like, Remember in that last movie where I sent you to New York? Uh, lol, yeah, I, I did that. That was that was me, my plan all along. You, you went on my orders. Do you remember these events happening in the past, Newt? Cool. Well, could you go back and, and do it again, though? Because I'm too old and we need young people on the posters for the movie. But Newt is, like, banned from traveling because last time he was there, he made it rain? And the forecast didn't call for rain, which made the weather people look like fools and they don't take kindly to that sort of slander in the US? Maybe? It's kind of confusing. I, I don't- I'm not a hundred percent sure. Point is, he's not allowed to travel. So Newt's gotta go to a meeting and try to get some forms for- You, you know what? You know what I really love to see in my magical wizard adventure? Is wrangling custom forms and going to meetings about political aspects. Just steal a damn blue car and fly, Newt. Alright, so we're back in New York and we can start getting the gang back together. Apparently Credence obviously survived the first movie. There was like a little fart floating off at the end of the sequel set up. And now everyone wants to find him and tell him to cheer the hell up and get a better haircut. I mean, look at that. <laughs> so Tina's off doing something orrery, looking very bored. And Lita Lestrange is at the ministry, also busy looking bored. The guy from the start that was like Grindelwald, but then turned back to normal, is like an old lady now. And he steps into an elevator at some point, and then he turns back into himself again. Honestly, for the entire movie, I had no idea who that guy was. He just like shows up sometimes and the camera seems to think that he's important, but I couldn't for the life of me figure out what he was doing there. Or if he was just like a really photogenic extra and the camera operator just couldn't resist. And it's probably in part my fault for not paying enough attention, but there are so many characters in this movie and the story jumps between them all so frequently that I still have no idea who half of the people in this movie even are. So anyway, Newt's traveled and he's in some apartment now and he looks really bored with his general surroundings as well. Until Funny Muggle Man and Dry Spell shows up. And this is where things start to turn strange. From here on out, the movie starts to both break down previously established characters and previously established spells. Like, remember how they did that rain thing at the end of the first movie? I guess Liquid Obliviate just rained down on all the muggles and they forgot all the magic from, from the finale of the, of the first film? And Jacob just, like, forgot all about his love for Queenie and everyone was sad, despite the fact that that shouldn't really have worked on anyone indoors at the moment, or you know, just anyone holding an umbrella. Okay, yeah, I know it's not actually Liquid Obliviate, but the point is they need to wipe memories, Men in Black style, right? Now it seems like even Rowling herself stood out in the rain that day, because the movie just sort of forgets about how magic works. So no longer are all the memories wiped, but apparently only bad memories disappear. So it turns out that Thick Chandler retained all of his good memories and Phoebe only had to fill in the bad ones again? But wait, so what about all of the muggles that saw magic happen but didn't consider that to be a bad memory? Like, what if you saw someone transform a pie into two halves of a pie? And you go, whoa, that was amazing, how did you do that? And then they memory juice you. Nah, mate, not a bad memory then. Didn't take. Sorry, bruv. Like, I don't know. I just imagine, like, an entire muggle population now just sort of teetering on the edge of triggering, like, a happy magical memory, and all the knowledge of the past movie just comes rushing back. Suddenly, the streets are just full of Yagami light from when he touches the Death Note for a second time. <laughs> Or like Ashton Kutcher from when he changes the past in Butterfly Effect. Like people freaking out over this magical knowledge just surging into their brains. But whatever. Blech. So it's revealed that Phoebes apparently had love drugged Chanandler and not just to come with her on the trip, but also to get married. So Newt removes the spell, which apparently is just something you can do now as opposed to Harry having to bring Ron to Slughorns for a special potion antidote. But whatever. So this is already a weird character moment, because judging from the last movie, it seems as though Homer was already pretty much in love with Marge, so why the drugs? Well, 
Marriage between a muggle and a witch is apparently highly illegal, but she really wants to anyway, and he doesn't. Cool. The thing is, when Peter Griffin finds out that Lois had essentially roofied him to abandon his better judgement, he sort of sighs and has this whole demeanor of, ugh, not again, ugh, which to me heavily implies that this is not the first time she's drugged him and he's caught her. Which again implies that there are probably more times where she's drugged him and he just hasn't caught her. So already the characters from the last movie feels... off. Oh, and speaking of forced romantic subplots for no reason, remember how the last movie ended with Monica being all flirty with Ace Ventura? Well, this movie starts off with her being all pissed at him because some gossip newspaper accidentally misprinted that he's getting married, when in fact it's his brother who's the bride-to-be. Why are we doing B-grade sitcom drama in a Harry Pot- I mean fantastic- I mean wizarding world movie? These are grown-up people, not some awkward teenagers trying to battle magical hormones. Oh, and side note, there's also this weird action scene like in the middle of the movie where they have this weird giant dragon lion lizard kind of thing jumping all over the place and I think someone's riding it. I don't know, because I literally had to close my eyes and wait for the sound to stop to know that the scene was over, because I was just- it was- it just hurt my eyes. It was hard to watch. Man, the action in this movie is... Ugh. Careful if you're prone to headaches is my tip. Anyway, I'm not gonna go through and describe the entire movie, I just wanna give you a sense of how nothing like before everything feels. They dick around for a bit more and we get to see what I assume is the Paris version of Diagon Alley. But this time, it's like an alternate dimension instead. Like you walk into this statue in a town square in Paris and you end up in the exact same town square? but a magical version of it. So it's just like an alternate magic only dimension of the same regular world Paris? It's really weird. Like Diagon Alley is obviously just a normal alleyway, like a hidden away passage and muggles or idiots and stuff. And you can fly to the Hogwarts Express from the outside world, and you can fly to the outside world from Diagon Alley. So like, they obviously exist in a separate physical location, just hidden out of sight. If you know where to go. This Paris version though is just like a pocket universe or something? Like what happens if you enter the statue and just like fly off, just as far as you can go? Is the whole world accessible or will you hit like an invisible wall if you go around the wrong corner like a video game? Here is where we get to my main issue with these new movies. The magic doesn't feel magical anymore. It feels cheap and easy thrown in to make the plot happen. We're never gonna recapture the old magic of the original movies. They were following children, and we were children. The whole world was new, and you discovered things, and you grew up with these characters. What I love about how they use magic in the original Harry Potter series, though, is how they explain the intricacies and the specifics of spell work well enough for the audience to understand how complex magic can be. Even a simple spell like Wingardium Leviosa takes a special swish and flick and a very proper articulation of Leviosa, not Leviosa. We see the struggles of learning spells and we see the characters fail a lot. We get a sense for how much skill and talent and focus non-verbal spells require. It presents magic as something well earned and hard to master. Don't get me wrong, even the old series did get a bit loosey-goosey with the concept after a while. I mean the fact that you can just flail about and scream Sectum Sempra in a panic and still almost kill a dude is kinda messed up. I mean, I'll take Avada Kedavra any day over that. Still, knowing how complex and specific magic can be, it solidified Dumbledore as this truly awesome wizard. Eowax. And seeing him and Voldemort battle and the crazy spell work they got up to just really set the precedent of, oh shit, this is serious, y'all ain't ready for this, Harry, run, bitch! In this new movie, though, everyone's a damn CG Yoda with a lightsaber. Everyone just has the power to randomly flop their wands about and sometimes say some words, sometimes not, some lights and sparks fly around, whatever needs to happen for the plot to move forward just sort of happens. It's like every spell has been replaced by just locomotor plot. Like imagine going through the original Star Wars series and watching Luke struggle to learn the powers of the Force and what to do and how to do it, and then you finally get to see the new movie and just like everyone has the Force. 
Han Solo knows the force now, and Jabba is back there, he's just like forcing shit all over the place. It's very much a legend of Korra to the original's last airbender. It's like, oh, it wasn't, it wasn't a big deal after all, these other guys were just dumb. And it really diminishes pretty much everything about the stakes and the threat. Like, I don't feel like Grindelwald is dangerous anymore because everyone just has these superpowers and no one fails at anything. No one tries to do a spell and messes it up. Hell, even Hermione was kind of shit at Patronuses. Pat Patroni? But in these movies, everyone could just do anything. And it just makes it boring. It's like watching a movie where everyone is Superman and they just punch and laser eye each other and nothing happens. But the worst thing is that it makes me feel like the old characters are just more shit at magic. Because look at all these guys. They can do anything. Harry can't even fix his own glasses, but these guys can make buildings and cook entire meals and conjure magical gold dust holograms that relive past events so that you can walk around and analyze where things went after they left a place? I don't know, that's an actual scene in the movie. Now, let's talk about fan service. Because boy howdy, is this movie brimming with it. Remember how the internet lost some of their shit over Nagini being revealed to have been this Asian lady who somehow got cursed and now she can become a snake? Except sometime in the future she's gonna get stuck like that? I guess being a snake is like pulling faces when you're a kid. If you become a snake enough, eventually you're gonna get stuck like that. Oh yeah, and your eyes get square from looking at the TV too much as well. But anyway, so she's there, and she goes all snake mode for like a second in one scene, so we can see that it's actually Nagini, and some dude explains how she's gonna be a snake forever. Although he fails to mention that Neville Longbottom will later be the one to essentially uh, decapitate this poor cursed Asian lady. So what's her role in the movie, you ask? How does Voldemort's most trusted companion play into the crimes of Grindelwald? Well, she's... there. And she looks kinda sad? I think she got the hots for Credence, because she usually hangs around with him and they, like, mope together. Maybe he's sad about his haircut not turning out so great. And she's sad because she was attracted to the longer hair. I don't know, they barely say five words throughout the movie. It's hard to know why I... Care. Well, hey, look, it's Hogwarts! <gasps> Remember when the movies were good? Hey, so Dumbledore's at school, and these dudes show up, and they want to talk business? Because having stuffy, angry people in great suits whine about things was my favorite part of the original series, too. So Dumbledore's like, Professor McGonagall, would you please take these kids somewhere else for a spell? <laughs> and he turns to the camera and winks to the audience. It's another one of those, Hey! I, I remember this? Moments. And I think this one makes even less sense, because it's 1927, and just a bit later there's a flashback to, I think, like 1910? But McGonagall is still there, like teaching, which is impressive, considering she wasn't born at the time. But who knows, maybe there'll be a, a, a spin-off McGonagall movie where she gets a hold of a time turner in her teen years, and she just like hooks it up to a power drill and goes to town and she ends up like a good like 10 years before her birth, with enough time to get a degree before the movie crew shows up to shoot the flashback. So the gang do a bunch of stuff I don't really remember because I was busy planning the best way to leave the theater without having to ask anyone else to get up, but they go to meet this really old dude, and Fred Flintstone shakes his hand and it makes like a crunching sound? Jacob Quals. Oh! Oh! And I think he broke all of his hand bones? And it's Nicholas Nicola Flamel. Flamel. And he opens a little door in the wall, and there's the philosopher I remember that thing! And then they shake hands again, and I think he breaks all of his hand bones again? Because he's really old. He don't look a day over 375. <sighs> there's a lot of dumb stuff in this movie. Look, I didn't go into this movie with high expectations. In fact, quite the opposite. After the first installment in this new series being lukewarm at most, I kinda just wanted to see Dumbledore again, maybe some nice shots of Hogwarts, and I got some of those things. I actually quite like Jude Law as a younger Dumbledore, even though he does this weird, like, sleight of hand street magician kind of card trick for no reason. And even though they discarded his usual fancy flowing robes with a gray suit, he's likable. Side note, there are so many boring gray suit people in this movie. Business people and politics are boring, Rowling. Get that out of the movies and stick it on Twitter. But Dumbledore seems nice. He's very underutilized though, I think the decision of going from 3 to 5 movies was a huge mistake. There's not nearly enough plot to fill these movies, and it shows. Everything 
drags on and there's so much stuff that doesn't serve any purpose. It almost reminds me of the Hobbit movies again, which is not the best thing. Johnny Depp, to Johnny Depp's credit, doesn't do another Jack Sparrow impression, but then again, maybe he should've, because at least Jack Sparrow has some semblance of personality. Grindelwald just spends the entire movie busy being bored. It doesn't seem like he wants to be there, it doesn't seem like he pays attention to what he's saying when he's saying words. He's just entirely bored the entire time, and I don't understand why Dumbledore would like a character like that. He does this massive speech at the end, and it doesn't seem like he's even believing what he's saying while he's saying it. So why should the people in the movie, let alone me as an audience member, believe that this is what he stands for? But I'm gonna take this time to sneak in my third mention of Benedict Cumberbatch, because I just think that he should really have been the one playing Grindelwald. I just feel like he could do a good job with it. He looks kinda like the young one they used for the books, and I feel like he could, he could be the guy. Like Bambersnatch! Shut up! I wish that the first movie had ended with the beginning of this movie. Newt and Dumbledore meeting up and having a chat about the brewing issue that is Johnny Wald. And I wish that this movie had focused more on Big D, not Dudley, and G-Man and their strained relationship. Maybe even flashing back to them being even younger and on the same side and getting to see how their relationship started to deteriorate. I feel like these prequels aren't really pre enough. Oh, and the ending? Second spoiler alert here, this is uh, spoiling the, the whole the plot twist at the very very end of the movie. 3, 2, 1. The ending is dumb. The fact that Credence is apparently a hitherto never even heard about sibling of Dumbledore's is dumb. The movie doesn't earn it, it doesn't build the character up. The fact that this is presented by Grindelwald to Credence, two characters we've spent very little time with and barely know at all, only for them to share this huge reveal of Dumbledore not only being in the dark, potentially, since he's never even mentioned having another brother, or alternatively Dumbledore knowing about this long-lost brother of his in the original series of movies, but just never mentioning it because he wasn't important. For some reason, not once did it come up in conversation with Dumbledore or Aberforth or in the book by Rita Skeeter. Nowhere was it mentioned that Dumbledore had another brother, sibling, Aurelius. It's dumb. And I hope that it's just a lie or some sort of scheme to manipulate Credence by Grindelwald and that it's not actually true because it's dumb and stupid. I mean, not even Ezra Miller, the actor who plays Credence in the movies, understood his role in the movies. You're Dumbledore's brother. I'm a what? A wizard. And I was like, this doesn't make any sense. What does it mean? Am I a metamorph magus? How do my eyes turn blue? I don't understand. You're not Abba, you're Aurelius. And I was like, who's that? And she's like, nobody knows about him but me, darling, and you now. And I was like, ah, ah, and then I passed out. All of this is my opinion, of course. If you like these movies, that's fine. It's just not what I had hoped to see from this world. But this is a good example of why I think you shouldn't really make sequels or prequels or anything leading up to or following an older series made for a now grown up audience. Because the audience is not gonna feel the same way that they once did about your new movies and there's a way higher chance, a way higher possibility for that audience to dislike your movies because they simply won't be in the same mind space as they once were when they watched the originals. You can make new movies set in the same universe but make them take place somewhere else, make them focus on completely different characters doing different things in different scenarios. This applies to Harry Potter, this applies to Star Wars, this applies to Jurassic Park. Don't make it about the same general plot. Make it in the same universe, but put it somewhere else with someone else, completely and absolutely disconnected. Because odds are, you just won't be able to please the original fanbase. I feel like the wonder is gone, the whimsy and the quirk. And I can't help but wonder myself if this is due to Rowling having gotten more and more political over the past years and maybe that's impacting her writing? They just feel so much more cynical and bitter. They're darker, grayer, more serious, and more mundane. Where I would have liked to see something a bit more magical.
Well, there you have it. My long-winded and probably rambly rant about the fantastic crimes and weird to grindle world. I'll be going to see the next one as well, whenever that's out. I don't think I like it. I hope I'm surprised. I would still recommend you watch the movie if you like the first one or if you like the original series of Harry Potter in general. Go watch it, make up your own mind, but I hope you found this take somewhat interesting. Take care. I'll see you around.